right, guys, welcome back. This is episode number 105, featuring the first part of my in-depth interview with the Sensible Software founder, Mr. John Hare. Now, Mr. Hare is uh, the designer of some of my favorite games for the Commodore 64, including Parallax and Whizball, and also for the Commodore Amiga, including, uh, of course, the Sensible Soccer games, as well as Cannon Fodder, and much more. He's a very, very creative guy. I was honored to have him on the program. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this. So without further ado, here is Mr. John Hare. All right, folks, I am here with Mr. John Hare. Uh, he's a game designer, an artist, musician. He's the co-founder of Sensible Software and Tower Studios. He's piped in from <laughs> Cambridge, England. How are you doing, John? <laughs> I'm pretty good, thanks. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, you seem to be a man of uh, many, many talents uh, the, with the art and the music and all this stuff. I didn't see anything about sports. I kind of expected to see football champion there somewhere. Oh, uh, well, I, I do play football. I'm not the best, but um, I do, I do still play. For my 45 years, I managed to heave myself around the pitch, and uh, I run slower than a, an elephant on Prozac, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Play a little cricket with the occasional Amstrad, huh? Yeah, we played cricket with the Amstrad, and I played a little bit of golf until my back went. Um, but no, I, I do. I enjoy sport. I'm, I like, enjoy competitive sports. I play a bit of snooker as well, and a bit of darts. What else? And you call them sports? <laughs> a bit I of champion bowling. <laughs> No, football's my main game. I love football. I, I play all sorts of football whenever I can. All right, so uh, before we get into uh, all the sensible software and all the stuff, uh, I want to mm -hmm. talk about what you're doing now. Uh, we mm -hmm. were talking a little bit before about this new game, uh, Word Explorer, so you can talk uh -huh. a little bit about that. Okay, brilliant. So, yeah, I mean, for me, Word Explorer is a very big deal. Uh, we'll probably talk a little bit more about what's been going on in the last few years, but it's been very hard to make original games and, and, and sell them into the market at all without committing financial suicide, pretty much, for the last 15 years. Um, Word Explorer is a game which I first started looking at about four or five years ago as a PC game, and we translated it into a game for iPhone. We're looking at all the different phones, basically, of iOS, Windows 7, Android, whatever, uh, Symbian. Um, also, it can be for PC, Mac, Sony... We're looking at a whole bunch Nintendo. We're looking at a whole bunch of different platforms, and we've got quite a lot of interest from different platform holders, which is great for us. Um, so the game is basically just a. Uh, it's a. It's a. I like to call it a 21st century crossword. So basically, you've got a. If you can imagine, you've got a map of the world. We've divided the world into 33 territories. So, for example, uh, in North America, you've got Western U.S., Central U.S., Eastern U.S., and then you've got Canada and Alaska, uh, Central America and the Caribbean, and they're your kind of six areas. And then in each, in each of those areas, we further subdivided it into eight what we call trips. So we set up a circular tour going around, um, say, uh, the eastern U.S. So you'll go from Boston down to the Hudson River, down to Durham, uh, then down to um, somewhere in uh, Florida. I can't remember where, actually. Somewhere in Florida. And then up to Tupelo, where Elvis was born, and then up to Dayton, Ohio, I think, and then back around to Boston. So it's like a circular trip. And and, it, and, it, and the way you travel from this place to place is by what we call a word grid. So you start off in a city, like you start off in Boston. Then uh, you see a, a grid of words. You see the letters B-O-S-T-O-N around Boston, and then these words shoot out, which are kind of like empty, but one of them begins with B, one begins with O, et cetera, et cetera. You click on the one with B, and it's an anagram. So you do the anagram. Maybe the anagram was, I don't know, bubble. You do the anagram of a bubble, so it comes out of Boston. And then the E at the end has further networks going off from that, like, like so. And so by doing this, you spread this network and travel across the country. Now, the point of the game is you're, you're a traveling photographer, basically. So as you travel around, um, you find these key, what we call keywords, cities like, I don't know, um, you might discover New York City, you might discover uh, Jersey, you might discover also landmarks, the Statue of Liberty, maybe, or maybe the White House, or maybe you find an animal, like, a, I don't know what kind of animals you get, they're a squirrel or something, or some kind of bird or some kind of fish which hangs around. So... We've done an amazing amount of research in this game. We've got two and a half thousand photo opportunities in this game across the world. So you travel the world 
with words, doing anagrams, taking photographs, collecting them, um, and then finding certain cities, like if you find Boston, that unlocks a ship which will take you across to Ireland, to Galway, and then you can start to explore Europe and stuff. So it's... Yeah, it sounds totally brilliant. I'm going to have to get a copy of that right away. <laughs> just well, got an iPhone. Hopefully, you know, we're about, we're about a couple of months away from launching it. We were hoping to get it out in June. Um, we'll see how, see how it goes. We, you know, it's, we're there or thereabouts. But it's, um, you know, for me, it's fun because it is original. It is innovative. It's, it's a different kind of area. And actually, I do kind of get tired of being pigeonholed as something from the past because a sensible... We were making new games all the time. You know, if you look at what we did, um, Wisble and Parallax, were, Parallax was an original game. Wisble was an original game, which was not that much like Parallax. Micro Soccer was totally different from those two. Shoot Up Construction Kit was different. 3D Tennis was different. Megalomania is a different genre entirely. Sensible Soccer was like Micro Soccer. Cannon Fodder was new. You know, we were jumping around all over the place. And then suddenly we, we, we got to a point where the whole industry seized up creatively because more money was put into the budgets because of the advent of 3d actually and because of that suddenly people backing us to just do what the hell we wanted just stopped it's like the brakes came on and, and it's only really recently since we've hit this new iphone led era of smartphones and also the online stuff the casual games and stuff that we've got platforms where we can again innovate without basically financially destroying ourselves is what it amounts to so um, it's fun for me to do what I've always done, which is make new stuff. I mean, I, I hate doing the same thing again and again. I mean, all the time, people expect you to just want to do other versions of Sensible Soccer or Cannon Fodder. Fair enough. But to be honest, I did it 20 years ago. You know, it's like you wouldn't ask a musician to go back and do... You wouldn't ask Neil Young, for example, to go and do the music he was doing 20 years ago. Uh, and, and, and I guess... Um, that's kind of my personality. I like to, you know, I'm into something. I want to work on it with, with different people sometimes or with the same people and just ride with whatever seems interesting at the time. And if, you, if you're good at it, you can make money from it. And I think this premeditated accountancy-led mentality of running media doesn't accommodate that kind of more, um, as, I, as I mentioned to you before, it's like alchemy. You have an idea, you turn your idea with somebody else and this suddenly this energy is happening where you're creating something which has its own life. You know, you're ba basically like giving birth to this new thing, which does take on its own life. Uh, that's how you create things. Uh, very much musicians who know that if you write a song and, and the first time you play it with a band and it just clicks and it works, it's fantastic. You know, it's, it's a better than sex moment, but beyond doubt it is because everyone's being selfish and yet everyone's enjoying the moment. It's actually like very good sex, I suppose. <laughs> so, so, and the same applies to making games or making anything. You know, it's it's it can't be written down in documents. Not all of it. You know, bits of it can be written down in documents. Bits of it need to be written down in documents. But you know, it got to the stage. I did a design for Canon for the three. It was two hundred and seventy page document. The game never came out. I did a design for Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll. It was a 1,500-page document. The game never came out. That needed to be done because there's lots of organization in there. But, you know, at the end of the day, all our hit games weren't document-based games. They, the, the, the game was based around um, what was happening on the screen. And we were modifying that and writing documentation we needed to support it and writing little plans and charts and stuff yes you know and a lot of detailed planning but not all documentation up front that doesn't give any room for um in the musical equivalent of arrangement you don't know how you might need to arrange it you don't know you do the first bit you see how it runs you then make modifications you make adjustments and this kind of this kind of fear of not being able to quantify everything up front uh incredibly stifling not just for games also in film and in other areas of media you see it now you know uh, uh, and what is a breath of fresh air about the iphone and the smartphone markets is there is some room for change the problem is all the guys running the business are so used to this way of over managing and over fearing you know not trusting creative people basically and by this i mean not just artists and designers but also technically creative people um you know, producers, 
uh, brilliant marketeers, brilliant businessmen. You know, there's, there's, there's creativity in all these areas, but there's a whole bunch of people sitting in the background who are fearful of, of the unknown. You know, they don't understand that publishing is about educated gambling, not about having surefire hits. If you want to have a surefire hit, go and work in Walmart. You know what I mean? Sell toilet rolls. <laughs> They're never going to go out of fashion, you know? <laughs> we were talking a little bit about Tiny Wings uh, uh -huh. uh, before. So would you have, first time you saw that game, if you didn't know anything about it, would you assume that would be this monster hit that it's become? Yeah, uh, we talked about Tiny Wings. I, I've got a theory about Tiny Wings. Tiny Wings, I mean... Okay, let's start at the beginning. In 1985, when I started making games, uh, and uh, and then 1986, we set up Sensible Software, and all through that period, up to about 93, in general, the game-playing public had picked up computers as an extension of an, an electronics hobby. Because pre to that, it was kind of like more home electronics, people making small things. And then when the... The, you know, the ZX Spectrum and a few of the machines at that time came out, people started, the people initially used those machines were those kind of guys who were interested in that stuff, almost exclusively male, I might add, as well. And so, and generally, the, 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 the quiet, intelligent, nerdy guys at school, you know? And so, <laughs> yeah, like us. And so, and so, um, and so, this... In general, when you were making games, what these guys tended to have in common in general is they had higher intelligence than the average person, that they were more interested in innovation and much more open to new ideas, you know, uh, much less inclined to say, you can't do that because it works like this, and more inclined to say, okay, that's interesting, let's see where this is going, and then to build on it. And, and that kind of spirit of, of, of intelligent people who were open to new ideas allowed us as innovators to just pour whatever we wanted into the machines and for people to accept it and not challenge it and not be fearful of something beyond them. In other words, people who see themselves as intelligent, when they see something which they don't understand, if it's done well, they tend to try and want to master it so they can understand it. They don't reject it out of fear of being made to feel stupid. They try to overcome it. Whereas when you go to a very big mass market thing, and a big example here is when, when basically when the Sega Mega Drive or the Genesis, whichever you want to call it, that was the turning point. You know, ran about that and then quickly after that PlayStation, you know, suddenly the average intelligence of your gamer nosedived, basically. And we were making games for the, for, for the not so clever kids in school who, who didn't want to have to struggle too much to master something. And, uh, who just wanted to basically play it because more inclined to play it to follow a pack. Like, my friend said it's cool, so therefore I'll play it. It must be cool. Am I allowed to say it's cool? Oh, yeah, great. I like it as well, you know. You know these guys? And, and suddenly we got a whole, you know, weight. That happened at the same time as 3D came in. So you got basically massive production cost increases, all the media companies sniffing around who just, control everything through accountancy so your warners and your sony's and your bertelsmann's and all these guys all moving in as a pack mid 90s and at the same time your audience was less able to cope with more challenging content so you just got a massive sea change of game making from the innovation that was happening throughout the 80s and the early 90s so this just stifling um very safe way of making games which were similar to other games so you've either got licenses or sequels or me too games you know and uh, what's great about Word Explorer for me, and it's a long time, when you consider we had so many number one games, I mean, I've had 10 number one games now I've designed, and yet no one would sign my games from 95 onwards. I mean, that's madness, right? Yeah, it is. And, 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 and so to just have the chance to make Word Explorer to me is a big deal. You know, okay, I'm self-publishing it, and I found some great guys uh, in Poland, Vivid Games, to work with. Um, but you know, it's, it's been very frustrating for me to have to, to stop my creativity for to make commercial sense, you know, or to, to limit it, to channel it corporately. I don't mind. It's been great. It's been interesting, but it's boring after a while, you know? Well, if it makes you feel better, John, you might be frustrated 
uh, from the designer point of view, but the ga uh, gamers like me are even more frustrated because we just keep getting the same old, you know, first-person shooters, you know, the same old games year after year. <laughs> well, at first, yeah. but to me, to me, I mean, I, 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 I'm a member of BAFTA, and I, I sit on the games committees and juries and stuff, and we, you know, every every year I sit down and play ten games basically to 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 for one of the awards. So I mean, I did the gameplay jury I was on this year, the year before I was on the sports jury. And uh, and I don't, to be honest, play many first-person shooters of choice. And I sat down and I played four first-person shooters this year. And uh, they're so similar to each other. You know, it, it, there are some differences, but it's like different levels of the same game with different art, you know, and a few little tweaks. Which but, four did you play, just out of curiosity? Uh, it was um, Call of Duty, Halo, um, Bioshock, and Mass Effect, which has turned into like a first-person shooter. I understand Mass Effect 2 I played. Now, I understand Mass Effect 1 was a little bit more about strategy and stuff, but I didn't get that. I just played it like a, actually, in my opinion, not quite so well-executed first-person shooter. You know, I mean, I actually got to understand from that exercise why Call of Duty is popular. Because actually what the game is really good at is it's got a really great flow. And you can just go and be mindless and it's quite enjoyable for half an hour. I, that's what my take on it, you know. It's not something I'd seriously get into, but for a bit of mindless fun, I thought it was quite well controlled. And, you know, as a designer, I mean, I've been a consultant designer now for 13 years. So I'm very quick at looking at a game, analysing the strengths and weaknesses. And I thought Call of Duty had a really great flow to it. You know, it enabled you to just pick up the gun and run, basically. You know, like run, forest, run. That's what the whole game was like. <laughs> <laughs> Which I kind of enjoyed. It was like a chase movie. And I don't mind chase movies. Um, but, you know, is it worth sinking half the budget for the entire games industry into games like this in the world every year? I don't think so. Is it innovative? Not really, not at all. It's like level design. It's like someone who's not a game designer saying, I want to be a game designer, which happens, of course, all the time, and I'm really aware of it. And what they really mean is, I've got a good idea for some kind of mod for my favourite FPS and maybe a couple of levels. That's not game design, you know. That's like me saying, I don't know, I want to be a cook, you know, because I've got a different way of cooking some kind of soup. You know, I like cooking, but I'm not a cook, you know. I mean, I consider myself a songwriter. I've written a lot of songs, but I'm still not professional enough to do it properly, you know. So, and certainly with football, I mean, you asked me earlier, I mean, I love playing football. I never, would never be a professional footballer. A, I'm not fit enough. B, I've never been good enough. I just enjoy it, you know. So, I think that, I think underlyingly, this is really insulting to lots of people and is aimed directly at Tiny Wings, by the way, which I think, is your, how you start the conversation? Uh, we're going to pick on Tiny Wings here today. <laughs> Tiny Wings is an insult to professional game designers that we've struggled to get our game design signed, and this very basic game, which could have been made in an afternoon by a decent team, has sold so many copies, shows the depths to which the intelligence of the average game has sunk. But actually, not just intelligence; it's more, it's more the experience. Underlyingly, what's happening in the iPhone is. There's a lot of people who've never played games before, and, and I have to say, a lot of these are women. Uh, we know that women have made up more than 50% on the kind of casual games on the PC and stuff, but in the kind of iphone kind of more action games, there's not really been the female market. And, and I think that, that you're going back to, it's almost like going to a foreign country and teaching someone to talk French, and they're talking like a four-year-old. It, it is really that basic, the amount of things you can do at once you must play tiny wings all you do is press your finger on the screen to decide if gravity is going to be turned on or not that's all you do for the entire game so there's it's so simplistic that um most of us have missed it of course now all of us are trying to recreate it by making simplistic games so you get this whole bunch of simplistic games with cute birds in them because this is another game with a cute bird in it the problem with tiny wings is is it kind of ignores the previous 25 years of games, which is good and bad. It, it kind of, it's bringing games to a new audience, but for us, we have to relearn. And, and it's, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like, I guess, really sophisticated 
composers of classical music would feel when suddenly they see the most terrible punk band um, with no with very limited musical skill um, getting the hit records when they've spent 30 years training to be you know classically brilliant and it feels a bit like that but what we have to do is to just embrace it and actually teach ourselves to like unwind some of our sophistication and that's all for this week's episode i hope you guys enjoyed that haven't even scratched the surface of this interview yet have a lot of really great stuff coming up the best is definitely yet to come so stay tuned for that also want to as always uh, thank everybody who has been donating actually had some very nice toast this week but i was unable to procure the ales in question so i hope you guys can find some alternatives uh, in the meantime i have this certified evil ale from uh, the Lucky Bucket Brewing Company in La Vista, Nebraska. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Hope it's not as evil as the brand implies. <laughs> and as always, I thought I would leave you with a quotation, this time from Mr. Neil Young. And tell me if this is an apropos. It goes something like this. When people start asking you to do the same thing over and over again, that's when you know you're way too close to something that you don't want to be near. True for Neil Young, true for John here, true for you and me. See you guys next week. That's the last damn thing you want to do is think of something. That's the, that is well, death. What do you mean by think of something? Come up with an idea. That's not what you want. So you, you don't know? consciously write I don't write want songs. to do that. No. I don't want to do that. That's the worst songs I ever wrote were written like that. I can't even put them out. <laughs>